Mr. Mary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, good morning. Welcome. Uh, thank you all for your testimony this morning. I, I think it should point out, in light of all of the challenges and difficulties you're facing, Nebraska, by certain measures, has had one of the best outcomes for service to veterans, particularly in terms of the measure of process, time uh, of processing claims. Uh, I think we were one of the states that actually took on additional caseload when other systems were under such severe stress. So I'm proud of that. It doesn't diminish, though, the need, obviously, to continue to work aggressively across the nation. But to the degree that we've served as a valuable template of service delivery, we're, we're happy to be in that position. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I, I really do appreciate your freshness of approach and your creative commitment to trying to rethink some of the architecture in order to get us all to the goal that we share the highest and best quality of care for our veterans. Uh, in that regard, I want to bring up a specific example from home. Uh, Omaha has a difficulty with our hospital, as you're quite aware. Uh, over the years, based upon a priority list, which is not necessarily the list of funding priorities, but is listed as a priority, which is, to me, a peculiarity. Nonetheless, it's floated from 30 down now to 10, 19, all over the place. Uh, the broader point being to, maybe that's based on analytics, maybe that's based on more subjective criteria, I just don't know. The broader point, though, is enhanced strategic partnerships are the way forward. It is the model for the 21st century of veterans' care. If, as, as you are, have been invited and as I, I know you are working to um, uh, commit to coming to Omaha, when you do, uh, you will be warmly received by uh, creative community partners who are ready and capable to think about, again, an enhanced strategy that looks at a new model by which we can build out a potential new facility if that's what's necessarily decided upon, as long as we have the flexibility for creative financing, or using existing structures that could be rehabilitated, or partnering with the excellent medical facilities through the University of Nebraska Med Center, Creighton Med Center, and other private facilities that are already there. Uh, a quick uh, anecdote, I've had uh, the American Legion and the Veterans of Foreign Wars in my office this week. And the committee has heard me talk about something, and you have as well, called the Veterans Certified Facility. And what I think this does is give us the ability to carry forward this important legacy of having the VA in charge of veterans' health care, but maybe embedding that within other systems, as long as we have oversight authority over it so that quality of care is delivered. But it gets us out of this problem of putting money under the mattress for years, sometimes decades at a time, in order to build out a facility, because we simply have been doing it that way for the last 100 years. The next 100 years, though, we can take that money that we do have, leverage it in strategic partnerships, and assure the veteran is getting the highest possible care, still while being under our authority. That's the new model and new way forward. I willingly commit our community to be your model template in this regard. I think, uh, I don't think that's an overextension of the desires of the community that I represent, uh, but I'd like to work with you as, whether it means new legislative authority or exercising the current authorities you have for creating and enhancing those strategic partnerships and labeling some, something like a veteran certified facility. I'd like you to respond to that, please. Well, we, we uh, agree with your, your comments. In fact, uh, uh, of the five objectives of my VA, uh, I think maybe perhaps one of the biggest ideas, other than being veteran-centric, is strategic partnerships. Uh, we are working very hard to establish strategic partnerships. And when I say that, I include, um, and I include the community. And I, I would just point to the example of um, we have a problem with homelessness. We're trying to drive down homelessness to zero, uh, virtual homelessness of veterans to zero by the end of this calendar year, yet we've had a lawsuit going on in Los Angeles uh, for four years uh, that, pre that stopped us from doing what we needed to do to use 380 acres that we had there uh, for homeless veterans. Um, I got involved uh, through a friend in Omaha. I found out who, the loss who was behind the lawsuit. We brought the community together, including the mayor and, and everyone else, uh, members of Congress, and we've come up with a solution and a memorandum of understanding and a plan forward 
to eliminate homelessness. So I, I want to do the same thing in Omaha. Perfect. Mr. Secretary, we need to get out of this trap of this priority list, which has, again, a model invented a long time ago, but is not enhancing the opportunity to leverage the strategic partners and actually get the services veterans need, need in a quicker fashion. We, we've, we've got to eliminate this, this construct because we're just carrying forward, as Sam Farr was saying earlier, we carry forward in time legacy systems and the Appropriations Committee gets trapped into whether or not we're going to plus up the same system or cut it back, rather than creating new architecture that actually makes sense in terms of service delivery. Does that mean my time's up? I, I didn't realize I talked that long. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and you did. At <laughs> <laughs> uh, this time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Joyce. Recognize Mr. Portmary. Uh, th this was related to the line of questioning I wanted to undertake. But first of all, let me make a quick recommendation. It, if there is some viable mechanism whereby you can creatively dispose of excess inventory and capacity working with communities, do not call it BRAC. <laughs> do, do, don't do that. Because this is a positive thing. We are trying to make you more efficient and effective, not close stuff in communities. And that means transitioning, whether it's vacant property or underutilized property. By the way, the VA clinic in Lincoln, Nebraska, where I live, has a similar dilemma. A very old, stately facility that needs to be preserved, enhanced and preserved, and there's development agreements that have tried to be worked, and it is completely stuck. In the meanwhile, what is happening? The VA is carrying SS capacity, taking money away from your primary mission. The community is not being as well served because there are other development opportunities there, and we're losing the opportunity to rehabilitate and preserve historic structures. So I'll think of, I'll come up with an acronym if you want, but don't uh, say BRAC. Sorry. We have um, a legislative request that we have submitted to give us enhanced use lease authority. Right now, our authority is limited to only supportive housing for homeless veterans. We would like to expand that back to the authority we used to have so we could bring in a broader range of people to use those beautiful historical well, when, facilities. This, well, perhaps, Mr. Secretary, this is the heart of the problem that we've all been talking around with our lofty ideals of strategic partnerships. The mechanism for this, one of them anyway, the creative financing mechanism, could be this enhanced leasing authority where you private build, lease back, or wh however you want to structure it. You said it, we used to have the authority, you no longer do. What happened? I think part of it was around uh, the issues in Los Angeles that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the Los Angeles campus had a rental car facility, uh, a laundry facility, and a whole bunch of other things. And as a result of that, um, the enhanced use lease authority got, got restricted. Uh, I think we're beyond that now. We've solved the problem in Los Angeles, so this would be helpful. The other thing that will be helpful, and we've done a lot of study on this, is with the strategic partnerships, we also have the ability to create mechanisms where we could receive funds from the private sector to help veterans. And we've looked at that authority as well. Well, I think what would be helpful, and you alluded to this earlier, is if we can quantify what you need in ter in the, uh, across the multiple platforms of what we've talked about in terms of enhanced authority that is going to give us creative opportunity to have the private sector either contribute or be involved in the financing so we can just get going here. There's no reason for all of this holdup. It's just that we're carrying legacy infrastructure of previous ideas as to how to do things. It's not a condemnation of the past. We had to do it that way. But we don't have to do it that way going forward. So I think as, a, as, a, as an outcome here, a tangible outcome, can you get back to us with the list after the evaluation is done of what specific legislative authorities you need, or if it's a matter of just cross-agency communication, as we talked about with the OMB, right. who has some stress regarding enhanced leases or, or, or private bill with lease back arrangements. That would be very helpful. And we'll if we do could that. do that quickly, that would be helpful. We'll do that. We'll do it very soon. Great. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And that concludes the second round. But before we depart, I just want to ask one quick question.